I love that Mary is single-handedly building an army of empowered women. <laughs> it's so awesome. Um, our final session today is just going to be remarkable. Uh, it includes a, a really fascinating roster of women leaders who each bring to the table a really unique skill set and experiences, backgrounds, and path to the boardroom. Our speakers are Lieutenant General Reynolds, who's Deputy Commandant for Information from the US Marine Corps, Peggy Alford, who is Senior Vice President of Core Markets at PayPal and a board member of Facebook and Mace Rich, Don Zier, President and CEO of Tivity Health and a board member at Haines Celestial, Spirit Airlines, and Tivity Health. And this afternoon's session will be moderated by the legendary uh, Betsy Atkins, who's a renowned governance thought leader. And uh, she's currently serving on the boards of Wynn Resorts, SL Green Realty, and Volvo. Help me welcome the panelists to the board. over there, can't see everybody. Well, first of all, welcome and thank you, and uh, amazing first two sessions, right? Really terrific. And uh, this one's even better, because you wouldn't believe how <laughs> smart these girls are, and how much insight. And we're gonna talk about leadership, and leadership in the board, but really mostly about leadership. And you know, when you think about leadership, there's a couple of different types. There's the visionary leadership that Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or Richard Branson, you know, are exemplars of. There's the inspirational leadership. You can think of someone like Winston Churchill or Starbucks with Howard Schultz. And then there's this newly emerging phrase of servant leadership. Uh, Procter & Gamble's A.G. Laffley was a great example of that. Um, you know, even uh, football legend uh, Tom Brady, right? He's a servant leader for his team. The team does better. So that concept of enabling the team. So when you think about, and my colleagues here are amazing, and you're going to hear an incredible wisdom. Uh, you know, what are the big leadership attributes, right? Is it the best out of the team, accountability, you know, in a culture of debate and discussion to get the right kinds of, you know, insights so that you can really empower the team. So with that as a preamble, Peggy, share for us, please, your own leadership philosophy a little bit. Yeah, well, I actually do feel like um, servant leadership is something that's always resonated with me in my career. Um, the leaders that I've been most attracted to have been those that have really been focused on clearing the way for the team, looking to make the team successful, saw themselves as someone whose job was to add context to a situation because I think as you climb the ranks, you soon forget that you don't, you have all the information and folks working within the organization have pieces of information. And so I think part of leadership is about providing that context and enabling your team to be successful. Really helpful. So the learnable moment for everybody in the audience to apply is how to be a good servant leader. Absolutely. I think, you know, to know that the information you have, uh, everyone might not have. And so how do you share information to point the team in the right direction and help them be successful? That's great. General Lori, um, you're the most unique person here because you come from an organization that builds leadership. Will you tell us a little bit about sort of the unique view you think that the, the military background has on, on leadership and your own philosophy? Yeah. So, so thank you. Um, first off, my brand is like this uniform. <laughs> so <laughs> I, was, I, I wanted her to call on me because I thought I can answer that. I was just, yeah, I'm a Marine. So, <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, right. So, so you know, in my line of work, um, it's about the, the mission. 
It's about accomplishment of the mission. It's both, you know, the strategic leadership of thinking about how to move the team, you know, uh, in a direction um, uh, that, that we're all, you know, in her Costco example, it was, you know, the CEO says take a left and they all take a left. It's, it's how do you do that? But it's also the kneecap to kneecap leadership, right? So it's the very personal leadership where you understand Marine by Marine by Marine uh, what inspires them to get up in the morning and be willing to co continue to put this uniform on and serve with the integrity and the dignity that it requires. And so that is, everybody is incentivized by different things. And, you have, and it's hard work to understand what incentivizes your Marines. Um, and so I think that's, you know, kind of the biggest lesson I've learned over the years is, is it's a very personal thing and it's also a very strategic thing and managing both at the same time. So the learnable moment for the audience who's taking notes is to be really effective as a leader, you got to get the best out of each person. That's right. And personalize that's right. what's going to work for them. That's right. Okay. Don? You have views on leadership, <laughs> and, and you have a particularly interesting view I'd love you to share about when you think about leadership as, um, you know, your thoughts on how culture plays into leadership. Will you share a little on that? Sure. I, I think culture is so important, and, and actually I think this is an area where as females, quite honestly, I think we have a leg up because I think a lot of times people jump right into strategy and getting it done, but if your culture, your foundation isn't right, all things fall apart. Like as a board, the number one reason you read about bad news stories with companies is because something was wrong with the culture. So I spend a lot of time thinking about culture and it's not a one and done moment. It's something that we continue to think about and evolve because organizations are organisms and they change constantly. I also think when you're thinking about culture, accountability comes really strongly into play. And another reason why I see companies fail or get in a confused state is when the leader doesn't set clear goals and expectations. And it's not so much about goals, it's more about the outcomes. But if there's not clear accountability, um, if you don't know what you're doing versus what someone else is doing, that's where politics come in, that's where jockeying for position comes in and it gets, gets messy. I mean, imagine if our armed forces didn't have clear accountabilities, who's doing what? You know, they get it right, organizations, corporations, not all the time. And the other thing I think as a leader that's so important is being adaptable. I think as you rise up in an organization and you think more about, um, people think, oh, I have to adapt to that leader. I have to adapt to his or her style. But the great leaders, they adapt to you. They bring out the best in everybody. And they adapt their style to what works for you or what works for you to bring out the best in the person. And don't hire cultural fits, hire cultural enhancers because that is what makes org organizations great. Don't hire the people that are just like you. Hire the people that are going to challenge you, that are not going to be yes people, that might make some of your days tough. But I think that's what good leaders do. They surround themselves with the that's best, right. and then they bring them to even higher levels. So a culture, uh, adaptability. And cultural enhancement. And be and don't hire people who are a reflection of you right. that will challenge you. So you've worked at PayPal and eBay and all these great companies. Where have you, what, what have been the learnings in your career? And what are sort of the, the learnable moments for everybody here who is a great leader and wants to become an even better one? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that um, diversity of experience is what um, makes um, you better. And so what I've always sought in my career is um, not so much a sort of ladder career where you're constantly progressing, but you look for those accelerated steps that are driven from the fact that you have rounded out your skill set and you're continuously adding to your experience by um, taking roles that are not like each other. And that's what enables you to create um, a, a valuable um, you know, uh, executive and somebody who is ready for whatever might be around the corner. And that is relevant to whether you're taking your next step in your career um, or whether you're trying to be on a board. I think that the more diversity of experience that you can demonstrate that you have where you've seen situations from multiple angles or from multiple parts of companies, um, that's what creates that, you know, value um, add to either a um, executive position or to a board. That's true. Uh, Lori, you're in 
the profession of building leaders. Right. So how do you assess if somebody's good at it and how do you coach them to be better at it? Um, I think that's a great question. I, th I think that um, not everybody has born leadership traits. And quite frankly, some people just don't want to lead. Um, so um, Mary was talking about this a little bit in understanding you know, the, the core inside of each of us. I think sometimes you have to draw the leader out of people. And certainly as I look around, I, I, um, I see a lot of women who exhibit the same, these same patterns of they haven't found their voice yet. And so um, giving women a voice in the Marine Corps is so important. It's giving them the confidence to sit at the table and, and, and just say what they think and say what they feel. Um, that's one of the things that I have been searching for is, or, or working on harder is just trying to, to, to do a lot more sponsorship of other women and enabling them uh, to find their voice because it takes way too long, way too long. And it's in a rank conscious organization like I'm in, it's even worse. So, um, you know, you just, you just gotta find those talents when they're out there and give them an opportunity to be, to be in the spotlight. Don, you sit on public boards, you've had board members as a CEO of a public company. So how do you think about leadership when you look at a board opportunity? How does that play in when you're assessing opportunities? Yeah, I think, I think it's important that as you're looking for a board, I, I don't wanna be on a check the box sort of board. It is true what Maggie said earlier, it's not about the four or five meetings a year, it's really about a board that is engaged and does the CEO actually want to engage with the board? Because some CEOs just want to, hey, I'm gonna talk to you four times a year. And I think as board members, you know, we put a lot of our time into being board members and it's a give and get sort of relationship. So what I found, I am on an airline board, I'm on a healthcare board, and I am on an organic food company board. And very disparate industries, and at the end of the day, every board, every time I go to a board meeting, I can take pieces of it back to what I do. So I think about, okay, what do I wanna learn? What can I give? What value can I give? And it is about, I think, that functional expertise, but I think what boards are looking for is not only the functional, that's important, but then the expansion. And sometimes I court trouble Betsy, right? Because I think one of the boards I just joined, I joined because there was an activist on the board. And I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. Let me learn about that playbook. And um, you know, have become great friends with the activist. But um, the point was, I wanted to learn about that because that's part of everyday America, everyday corporate America. So it gave me an opportunity. So sometimes courting trouble, always about learning, continuing learning and give back and give, give and give back. Give and get back. Peggy, you said earlier, it isn't always exactly the perfect you know, line up into you know, the right when you're planning your career. Yeah. What have been the, the areas and the, the stories or experiences where you learn the most in your career? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, so I actually, one of the, the roles that I had um, when I was part of eBay that was probably the biggest learning in my career was when I had the opportunity first to be the CFO of a company that we had acquired and then went on to run that company. And it was a small, if you looked at it in the eBay portfolio, it was a small company with 100 people and they didn't really care about it. It wasn't on strategy after a couple of years. But it gave me the, we actually cared, you know, the, the hundred people that were looking to grow the company, we cared a lot. And I really got to see how product interacts with marketing, interacts with sales, how you need to bring them all together to further a strategy. And so while ultimately it wasn't gonna be material to the overall eBay results, that was the time in my career where I really understood and learned how all the various aspects of a company need to come together in order to execute on a strategy and how you have to get the product folks um, working really well with the sales folks and um, why the finance guys make sense and why you know it makes sense to ensure that your sales guys ha are on the right sales plan. All of those skills are things that help me so much in my career going forward as I had roles that were at much 
broader scale, but that I learned within this little company that was a part of a much larger company. And I think learnings like that um, in your career are less about you know how it's going to prepare you for that promotion or for that um, that larger role. It's about how you actually become a well-rounded executive to make yourself um, you know potentially available for lots of different types of career moves in the future. Uh, Lori, you've had a few different zigs and zags. You've done unusual things. Um, Will you share some of your story on the, the different roles and positions that you've done in your career and where were the learnable sure. moments? Yeah, I, I can. So, uh, you know, one of the things that Maggie said this morning was, or earlier today was really, she's spot on and it's the areas that you sometimes, you'll get a job that you never anticipated getting. It's off the track that you had laid for yourself and like, this is it, this is the end of my career. That happened to me like four different times. And every, every time that happened to me, it was, you know, to Contessa's point, in, in retrospect, that's exactly what was supposed to happen for my career because it made me who I am today as a leader. So, you know, as a major in the Marine Corps, I was assigned to recruiting duty. Um, nobody wants to go on recruiting duty. But I, so for three years, I managed the recruiting service in Eastern Pennsylvania. But what I learned on that tour was that you have to be professionally curious. You have to ask the next question of your Marines because my, your Marines will tell you only what they want you to know until you dig. You have to keep digging. And so be professionally curious. As a Lieutenant Colonel, uh, now I'm in command of a battalion. I'm in Fallujah, Iraq. And I learned that the little standards matter. The daily habits matter. The habits and the standards that you establish as a leader um, you know, for me, it was pick up the trash. Just pick up the trash. We're going to have a clean camp. And what I learned when I started enforcing just how our battalion looked, uh, and our job was to establish a communications network across Western Iraq. So just having a standard of picking up the trash carried over to, number one, their pride in our unit, and also how they provided that service as a, as a, as a network provider. And so those habits um, matter. And then finally, as a colonel, now I'm deployed again in Afghanistan. I am a camp commander in Camp Leatherneck, which is on the Iranian border now in, in Afghanistan. And I have a group of uh, Bahraini policemen that work for me. And they said, I don't know if, I don't know if they're going to work for you, Colonel, because you're a woman, right? And so, so they're, they're, uh, most of them are from Pakistan, and they're trying to earn their citizenship in Bahrain. And what I learned there was they just wanted to be led by everybody, by, you know, like everybody just wants good leadership. They needed a place to worship. They needed a place to have their kind of food. And they wanted to be left alone after they did their job. I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> and so it's just basic leadership. That's all people are looking for. And so those kind of three things have kind of guided me throughout my time as a general officer. And it's, they're just easy. They're just easy to do, but if you do it well and you learn to listen as a leader more than you talk, you're going to be fine. You know, you make it easy sounding <laughs> basic <laughs> leadership. But, you know, so what – so you boiled it down. Fabulous. So, Don, what is basic leadership when you think about it? What are those few key things that I'm going to ask you next? So start thinking. <laughs> um, I got the so, early warning. Uh, because, you know, it, it's such a, a, an all-encompassing word. And, you know, how do we boil it down so that it's learnable for us to go away and digest the wisdom of, you know, what is it that we should think about um, and what makes a great leader? What, what is it? I think it's, of course, it always starts with integrity, right? I think that it, integrity and being authentic, I think that's a, key, that's a key thing. I think active listening, we talked a little bit about that. I think that is something that also is really important. Um, rewarding for performance and outcomes because at the end of the day, no team, no winning team describes themselves as mediocre. So you have to reward high performance and set expectations. Um, so I think about it. I think about it that way, and also being approachable, because I think when sometimes leaders they put themselves on a pedestal, 
they don't know what's going on within the organization. So I think it comes down to being active listeners and also approachable and continual, continually asking for input. Our journey is never done in terms of being a leader. We're constantly learning, evolving, reacting. And I think one of the most important things for me as a leader is to, you know, when I was in my 20s, 30s, I had mentors. Then I had coaches. Now I have trusted advisors. But I have people outside the organization that can call me on myself. They can say, hey, Don, that's bull, or whatever, that keep me accountable for who I am and make sure that I'm operating in a way that is authentic to me. And I think having that network of trusted people around you helps you in terms of being even a better leader. Peggy, what do you think? So I actually think, what I, I actually learned this um, later in my career. I, um, I think earlier somebody had mentioned that, um, you know, you'll hear people say, I'm one person at work and I'm a different person at home. And, you know, you, you, you find yourself thinking that there's a way you have to be in order to be perceived as, um, as you know, um, earning the place where you are. And that's a constant struggle because, you know, there's always the, you know, do I actually belong here or whatever. And so I actually think that, you know, authenticity as well as um, just, you know, creating the personal relationships with your team and letting down your guard and actually sharing when you don't know everything or when you're still trying to figure things out um, actually lends a ton of credibility to a leader. And I've seen, um, I've seen leaders who are tremendously effective and also that, um, you know, are very honest about what they know and don't know. And I think it um, comes as a surprise often to teams, but I think it builds a lot of respect for that leader. And it's difficult to do if you're still kind of struggling with, you know, your confidence or whether you feel like you should be where you are. But I think making yourself... Um, own the fact that you don't know everything and not always having to be the arrogant um, person in the room um, creates a lot of um, credibility to a leader and creates loyalty within the team. I, I think that, that that's very true. I'm, I'm going to start with you, Don, on an, a, and ask you for a story and then so you guys think of your stories. Um, when we were chatting, I had the chance to speak to each of you before. Um, Don shared a story about, as a new uh, CEO at Nutrisystem, how she went to the call center and, you know, went and met with all the people who never get talked to, except, you know, the customers talk to them and, and the learnings about that. And, you know, I think it's interesting if you'll explain sure. that and, you know, think about a, a, something that you did a little differently that helped you as be a, a better leader and experience in your background. Please, Don. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the hardest things to assess for when you're coming into a new company is the culture, because when you're interviewing, when you're going through the process, it's all, you know, you get, you get a bit of the story, but until you're actually there, you don't know what's going on. And, you know, as a weight loss company, January is a really important time of year for us. So I went down to the uh, contact center and the phone's, weren't ringing. This was back in 2013. The phones weren't ringing to the extent that we needed them to. And I asked the contact, contact, contact center folks, first off, they asked me, why are you down here? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I'm on the third floor. I came down to the second floor. They're like, well, nobody's ever really come down here from marketing or from the organization before. So this is different. And by the way, they told me if actually marketing had come down here, we could have told them why their commercials don't work. So I'm like, well, why didn't you go upstairs and tell them? Well, you know, we don't talk to each other. So immediately I got an immediate impression of the silos. And I began thinking, these are the people that are hearing the things first from our customers. They are our first line. They hear on a day-to-day -day basis what's happening. And nobody's talking to them. And they were, you know, viewed as um, like second class. They weren't really part of the company. So we quickly established rules where, you know, okay, everybody has to go listen to the contact center. And then I started inviting the contact center whenever we were having ideation sessions, like tell me what you hear because you're my, you're my focus group. You hear what's going on. And what I very quickly learned is the contact center, a beautiful thing began to happen. They began talking to me in sentences, coming to my office and just sharing things with me. And as I'm having a conversation with them, what quickly happened is one sentence would be the spark for a $10 million idea, 
a $15 million idea, a $40 million shake business. So as they told me what was happening, really, you know, that active listening made such a huge difference. And now today I would say, you know, we launched the South Beach diet. We didn't get it right initially because nothing ever goes perfect. But within two weeks, because we were talking to the contact center, they said, hey, the food's great, this is good, but you have a little problem. It's not fitting in the freezer. You know how long it would have taken me to figure that out, that we were shipping too much to the home and that it wasn't all fitting in the, in the freezer? We said, well, Nutrisystem fits in the freezer, but the packaging was different. So, you know, really making sure that you're talking to everybody in the company and getting those three. So that was a real lesson to me and um, a lesson for the whole company because now we're one company, which is so important. But, you know, really stay close to your customer. I guess that's my message. And you know, when people talk to you, you learn about the culture and silos and things that are working and things that are not working. Yeah. Peggy? Yeah, I mean, I think along the lines of um, being willing to share some personal in order to um, both make it okay for others that may be struggling with the same things. Um, you know, I, I started my career when, you know, years ago, when it wasn't really okay to talk about what you were dealing with at home and what you were dealing with at, at work. And I think for most women, um, they're often trying to figure out how to balance what's going on at home as well as um, trying to build their career. And so I found myself, you know, kind of making my, I have a, I, I, I have a two-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 21-year-old. So I, I have a lot to manage. I have a husband that also has a career that he cares about, and he travels as well. And so we're constantly trying to make it all work and um, not always doing it well. And so I find myself at work sharing stories about, you know, kind of, what my last weekend was like and what I, you know, what I had to do when I had to travel um, and also had a kid that was supposed to be going back to school and I was going to miss his first day or whatever. And so I found that sharing the stories about, you know, what you do well, what you don't do well, um, sharing tips that you get from other people um, that help that have helped you as you're managing all those things, that all creates not only um, a, a, an environment where people feel like they can bring their whole selves to work, but it also um, enables them to see you as human and, and, and really understanding what you might be struggling with as you're trying to you know, lead, lead them, lead the team, lead the parts of the company. That's great. Lori, will you share a story and then we'll, we'll uh, just uh, make sure, how are we on time? Because I know we need to leave a little time for, for questions. I lost track. Are we okay? Okay, good. I guess the story is, is a little bit of, of, of both of what you've heard here. Uh, it's a story of uh, understanding that I was a little bit vulnerable and that I needed to bring more people into the problem solving than normally I would have. So I was a commander of our cyberspace force for three years, and it was very new in us trying to understand how to fight in the cyber domain. So not cybersecurity, but how do we use cyber as a weapon? How do we mature that capability? And um, so for the first time in my career, we have this new domain of warfare. So if you think about like the early days of aviation where we knew we had pilots and planes, but everything that makes an airline run, mm -hmm. we didn't have any of that. The runways, FAA, the air traffic control, we didn't have any of that. And the Secretary of Defense said, you have two months to deliver an effect against a particular target. So, and I was new. I didn't know very much about cyberspace. Cyberspace is incredibly technical, incredibly technical. And so what it forced me to do was just think differently about how to lead in that environment because the Marines knew that I didn't know what I was talking about. I, <laughs> I would have to say, they'd, they'd come talk to me and I'd say, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing for you. Are you, is this a good thing or a bad thing that you're telling me? And they go, it's good. I'm like, that's great. <laughs> that is good, you know. So, but, but I had to bring them all to the table. I had to bring them all to the table from the youngest Marine to the oldest Marine. And we just had to problem solve together in a way that we probably wouldn't have done in any other domain where experience and routine ruled the day. Because we, it was new. And so it really democratized leadership in a way that was incredibly powerful. And it also worked. So I learned, they saw me learn, um, and it just, it really brought the team together in a pretty good way, so. Thank you. 
Really good. Um, I'm going to turn now quickly to the board. So, Don, uh, what does good board leadership look like? You've been as a board member. You've been as a CEO. You're next. I think asking the asking the right questions. So, and asking the probing questions. It's it's. Um, I, I think that is critically important and understanding the culture because I had the opportunity this past summer, I think I was telling you, Betsy, I took a four-day course at Harvard on making corporate boards more effective. And in this typical Harvard manner, we studied all the case, case studies of companies that did not do it well, and there was a theme there. Companies broke down if something was wrong with the culture, and then the thing was then did, did management communicate it? effectively and quickly enough. So I think it's it's really setting the expectation on a board, a well-led board, asks the tough questions, um, focuses on culture, focuses on risk management, lets the, lets the management team manage because our job is governance and oversight, but I think that that is critically important and I think diversity because I do think a diverse board is a stronger board and that can be diversity gender, it can be age, you know, you don't see, um, you know, Maggie back then being a 28-year-old person on a board. Today, that's almost unheard of. So, I mean, I think that's fantastic. So, I think it's, it's diversity and asking those tough questions. So, you're on one of the most famous boards around the world, Facebook, um, and we know that you can't break confidentiality, but uh, when you <laughs> look at, uh, you know, board dynamics, and you've been on other boards as well, you know, what makes a board well-led in your mind? Yeah, it, well, it's interesting because, you know, I'm new to the Facebook board, and, um, you know, when Mark asked me to go through the process, um, what I said to him was, um, okay, you do realize I am, like, by far the least successful person that's going to be on this board, and he was like, no, at the end of the day, like, you have something to give, and, and, and so I think it's about figuring out what that thing is that you bring to the board and like what value, um, what, you know, what, what is different about your experience that can really add to the dynamic of the board. And then having the confidence to actually um, participate, right? Because, um, you know, Mark Andreessen's on the board and Sue Desmond Hellman is on the board and, um, you know, the, Ken Chenault, who was the chairman and CEO of American Express. And so it, it would be easy to say I have nothing to offer here. But the reality is everybody builds throughout their career and they have learnings that someone else who has the most successful career may not have been able to form because they didn't have that same experience. And so um, a good board um, brings a diverse set of experiences and that diverse set of experiences can be built from like what brought you to where you are in life, right? And so that's why having ethnic diversity and having um, diversity of gender and having diversity of experience, not having a bunch of, um, you know, VC guys on the board, because that's how it starts, right? A lot yes. of times companies, um, it's all the investors that are on the board. But as you enter that next, next stage of growth, what becomes really important is having someone that understands what, um, how to bring the very best talent into a company, um, how to ensure that you're thinking about, um, you know, what you should be measuring, um, so that financial um, expertise. And so all of those things are really important, and that comes from lots of different sets of experience. So knowing what it is you bring to the board and then being okay with that, the fact that there's going to be more successful people around you, but you still have something to contribute. Having the confidence to find your voice. Absolutely. Yeah, it's important. So General Lori, your boards are different. Uh, you, you sit on, I'm sure, lots of different military group boards and... Uh, tell us, what makes them well-led? Are they very uh, sort of, I have this image that they're very, you know, we'll call on you when we want your opinion. Are you allowed to have free dialogue? <laughs> Give us a window in. <laughs> well, first off, my board of directors is Congress. So, uh, <laughs> so do they listen at all? Do they do the act of listening, Don? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, but they ask great questions. So, <laughs> just so she, well, so well the C-SPAN cameras on only, though, right? Right. Okay. Right. They're really, really good questions. Um, <laughs> I think I got myself in trouble just there. For no, no, time. no. Um, no, it is true. We are accountable to Congress, and so um, 
Um, so there's always that understanding of uh, we work for the American people. And so our stakeholders are you, right? So, um, so there's that understanding. But I think inside, you know, the the board, if you will, the, you know, so the commandant has seven deputy commandants. I'm one of his deputy commandants. Um, but even as a three star in the Marine Corps, I have to remind myself to have my voice, because I have a commandant right now who just wants to. He's an introvert. He just wants to hear. He he is a Fantastic listener, fantastic listener, and he makes his decisions up here. And so I recognize, okay, I got to make sure that when I get my opportunity, I'm letting him know what I think, because there's right. So I think understanding your boss and how your boss makes decisions is really important, so that you get that opportunity and you take those strategic opportunities when they come. Um, because my, the last commandant didn't think like that, and he, you know, he didn't make decisions like that. And it also, I think, as a leader, it's understanding how you make decisions and letting people know, this is how I do this, so that you know, you're know you sharing that uh, with all the people that so we can all be effective together. So I don't know if that answered your question. It is very kind of conservative, though. If I can just, I'll let you in on that. It's a little bit conservative. <laughs> Does that mean? Not a lot of giggling like this. I can okay. just tell you that. <laughs> okay. Mm, okay. Um, as, as we uh, look to wrap up here on our last question before we throw it open to everyone, um, I'd, I think it'd be very valuable if, you know, we, you know, if each of you summarize a little bit on your leadership philosophy and the distillation of what you think are the learnable moments of what makes a great leader, because everybody here in this room is already a leader and they all want to get to be an even stronger leader. So, Don, will you start? I think be adaptable. And um, by that, I mean bringing out the best you can in your team. They shouldn't have to adapt to your style. You need to adapt to each individual to bring out the best in them. And I think that is what makes an organization run well. And hire cultural enhancers. Hire those people that will um, debate that aren't yes people, that will challenge. Challenge and debate is not bad. It doesn't mean friction, it doesn't mean problem. Generally it means there's good creative tension to move an organization forward because those yes cultures generally get stuck. So I would say those are my two. And if one more would be, you know, have an advisor, have that trusted person in your pocket that can help hold you accountable to yourself. Thank you. Peggy? Um, I would say define success. So ensure that you know f the team understands um, and is aligned on what success looks like. I think um, being authentic um, and re also realizing that um, as a leader, you have more context than the members of your team often. And so be willing to always um, explain um, why you're asking what you're asking for, like what, you know, and it sort of aligns with the first one, what success looks like, why are we doing this, and what are, what, what are we trying to, what are we trying to do, and, you know, being willing to share when things change, why things are changing. Um, so I think providing information becomes really important as a leader. Really helpful. Yeah. General Lurie? Yeah, I think, I think going back to, and, and Peggy brought it up a couple times, I think she's right, is having those measurable outcomes as a strategic leader that you are sharing, you've shared the why. This is why what we're trying to do is important. Get the buy-in from the team that when you're not watching, they're still, that they are disciples of where it is that you're trying to go. Um, but then, again, it's, it's being approachable. Um, you know, sometimes we forget the longer we, the, you know, as we're sitting on a podium. Um, <laughs> you have to be approachable to your folks who really understand what in the world is going on out there because if you want to impact the people who are getting all the work done, you got to be in their world. Uh, and then that final thought is just, you know, again, uh, the, the day that I really feel like I started to become a better leader was the day that I learned uh, to listen to understand as opposed to listening to respond. And that was a game changer for me. I learned that on recruiting duty, and it was a game changer for relationships, for my, my ability to lead. I mean, it was so um, you got to listen. Boy, that's powerful. Listen to understand. 
And, and the other thing that I heard come across is the empowering of your team, right? Hold them accountable, but you gotta delegate and empower them to actually do the mission. So three amazing leaders, unbelievably intelligent and insightful. I learned so much. So let me open it up and see if there are any questions. Anybody have a question? Yes, Lisa. We repeat it so everybody hears. So her question is, uh, what what does the military teach about leadership that is applicable, really, to to uh, the corporate world? I think all of it. You know, we servant leadership. You know, we we teach from the beginning. Officers eat last, and physically and literally, if you are in a Marine Corps Chow Hall and there is a line of Marines, the officers will be at the back of the line. It is a symbol that we are taking care of you. There's no more food, I'll go find something else. It's that idea of if you take care of the Marines that they will take care of you. Um, and so those kinds of principles we learn early on, but I think all of them directly applicable to uh, anybody who is putting blood, sweat, and tear in, into an organization. God bless you. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yes. Um, so shall we ask each person? Peggy, how do you find confidence when things seem stacked against you? Um, I try to tell myself that um, people can't see my lack of confidence. So I think, um, you know, I've had enough people tell me over my career that I seem more confident than I feel. And so I think sort of going back to that um, enables you to sort of just continue on through it. Fake it till you make it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> the way that I would answer that is it's, it's if not me, then who? I mean, if, if I am there, if I have the opportunity, if not me, then who? Why would I pass up an opportunity to kind of, if, if I'm fo I've learned to follow my gut, every time I don't follow my gut or my instinct, I regret it. So it's learning to trust yourself you know, as these experiences are compounded and you got these stackable um, skills now, you just have to go with it. I, th I think as a leader, people watch you. And if you're not confident, if you don't exude confidence and belief in what you're doing, everybody's gonna follow that cue. So I think as a leader, you need to set vision, strategy, and be confident. And even if you're not feeling it totally inside, it's really important to portray that. And one of the things that I've learned is um, different experiences, again, some great, some not so great, but things change. Things change all the time. I worked for four different CEOs in a five-year period, very, very different experiences, but got really, got confident that if this is not working right, change will happen to get me to a new place. So I think confident and comfortable with change. I think a lot of us are not comfortable with change, but a lot of great things happen with change. Great, thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. So I'm going to repeat it in case it wasn't heard. So hypothetically, you join a board. Uh, the environment in the board is just not responding. Your voice isn't being heard for whatever reason. It's gender. It's whatever. How do you get your voice heard and make an impact? Um, please, let's just go right down the line. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so I actually had a, had a situation, not on a board that I'm on, but one that I was involved with for a while. And um, when I was leaving the board, they were looking to replace me. And the chairman said, well, we were thinking about potentially bringing on two women. But I wanted to know what you thought, because I don't feel like at this stage we should really be thinking about governance. And I was like, well, I would hope that you're not adding women for governance. Like, the, you know, think about what it is that you need in order to have, help the company be successful. And... If, they, if, if you're looking for women, they should check other boxes besides like 
the gender box, right? And so I definitely think that as you're evaluating a board, you should ask questions that would enable you to determine if you're just a check the box or if there's actually something that they're looking for outside of your gender or diversity um, part. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, the more knowledge you get of a company or the more knowledge you get, then you will have something to add and you may have a situation where you might start in a place where you feel like they don't want to hear what you have to say, but be confident that you have something to bring to the table and you will change their mind. Um, and so I think it's just about gaining knowledge about what the company's doing so that they would have no choice but to listen to you. I think I'd offer two thoughts on that. The first, I think you heard earlier, um, and it's this idea of, of having your coalition you know, building your coalition of folks who can help you with how you articulate whatever that thought is or how you're coming across. You know, you need somebody to kind of like, we call it, you know, red team, red, red team me on this. Am I, am I saying, are you hearing what I'm saying? Um, then I think the other thing is you have to put it into um, context that the board will understand. So when I, for example, talk about diversity in the United States Marine Corps, I don't want you to hear me talk about integrating women into combat units. To me, diversity is the single biggest thing and advantage we're gonna have over our two peer adversaries who are not diverse, they don't think diverse, they never will diverse, it's their shtick to not be diverse. And so that's our advantage in the next fight. And so putting it into context that they can't help but go, I never thought about it that way. Speak their language. Speak their language. Don? Um, I love what you just said about the diversity thing as a country against our adversaries. So brilliant. Um, what, I, what I think about is don't talk just to talk. So when you have something to say, say it but make sure you're not the one pontificating because we've all been in boardrooms where it's, there's some degree of pontification going on. Say what you say, be crisp, make your point. I think um, the technique that Maggie shared earlier because I'm, I know I've had it happen, I've heard it happen where you say something and then it gets repeated and you're like, what just happened? Mm -hmm. But so you can rephrase or things along those lines. And I think a good way to get comfortable and provide value is you want relationships on the board, but you want the relationship with the CEO and build that relationship, build that, build that, and make sure that the management sees you as value. Because again, the value you bring to the board largely is not those four or five meetings you attend. It's the value you bring to the management team. And if they invite you in to, you know, for advice and for different things along those lines. Really great. Other uh, questions? We've worn you out. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have you all. Thanks for staying. And uh, what a fabulous group of panelists. <laughs>